Welcome back to Approved Unto God. I'm Joshua Govitz. We're in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 18. Last time we made it down to verse number 4, and today we'll be going from verse 5 down to verse number 9. It is not good to accept the person of the wicked to overthrow the righteous in judgment. A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calleth for strokes. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snares of his soul, are the snare of the soul. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down in the innermost parts of the belly. He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is great waster. Father, Lord, please bless your word today. I pray, God, you would fill me with your spirit. Lord, I can't do this on my own. Uh, well, I don't even want to attempt to, Lord. And I just pray, God, you'd fill me and use me, that you may be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. It is not good to accept the person of the wicked to overthrow the righteous in judgment. And I was just listening to a message from Brother Knox, uh, one of his brand new messages. Uh, you can check this out uh, if you want to hear a little further about this, but I'm not going to get into it as deep as he did. But he was in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, talking about using the wicked to overthrow the righteous in judgment talking about a church of people that would go to court over matters and not have the judgment of the church as pertaining a matter, biblical judgment. You know, and, and it's amazing that so many people have a bad testimony in this area. They will take one another to court. And the reason why they do that is because they already know the judgment that the church would make. And they're not interested in that, so they're going to go to a worldly court system. And uh, it's not right, it's a bad testimony, and uh, Christians need to quit doing that. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 real quick and see what that's talking about. And I'm not going to go too deep into it. Like I said, I recommend Brother Knox's message on it. Probably can't help but repeat some of the stuff I heard from him. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. You know, it's amazing that you would go to law amongst, uh, before the unjust. That judge is an unjust judge. That judge is not going to use the word of God to decide in a matter. But he has a title. He went to college and therefore you act like he's more qualified to judge but he is not he is not verse 2 do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world you don't know that why don't you know that aren't you in the book well that's right you're not in the book that's why you're in court taking another brother to court because you don't read the Bible and if the world should be judged by you are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters so the world's going to be judged by you? Yeah. You know that uh, Bathsheba, or not Bathsheba, but excuse me, but uh, the Queen of Sheba, that's a different Sheba, <laughs> the Queen of Sheba will rise up in judgment against one of the uh, towns over there in Jerusalem area. I forgot, I forgot what town it was, if it was Caper Capernaum or what town it was. But Jesus says she will rise up in judgment against you. Because they went to, to hear Solomon, and to, she went to hear Solomon, excuse me, and traveled a great distance to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And he said, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the personification of wisdom. And yet they wouldn't hear him. They wouldn't hear his righteous judgment. And, and Jesus said, in the day of judgment, at that great white throne judgment in particular, I will use the Queen of Sheba as a witness against this city. He also says that Sodom and Gomorrah, it, it should be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for a certain city. And he talks about, the, about Nineveh judging because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, a bigoted, racist, hateful 
preacher that that didn't even want to do that job. He avoided it uh, as far as he possibly could until God pretty much directed his path into that city. And they repented at it. They repented at the preaching of Jonah. And yet there was a greater message being preached that day by Jesus Christ, and they wouldn't receive that message. So you know who's going to be their judge? Nineveh will. And you know who's going to judge these lost sinners who heard the gospel at a street light, read the signs, but put their window up, turned their music up, flipped us the bird. God says, I'm going to call up those saints that witness to you. And you're going to say, well, nobody witnessed to me. Well, nobody warned me. And God's going to say, really? Call them up. You'll start calling them up. Weren't you on that corner? Let's play it back. There, there. You were on that corner sitting at that light, and there was seven preachers or seven saved people out there trying to plead with you. There was 14 of them out there, and they were holding sight. And you saw them all. You looked at them all. You sat there and read them carefully. You drove by. Matter of fact, you drove by four times and flipped them the bird, and you read those scripture signs. And, and they're going to be judged by us. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more the things that pertain to this life? We're even going to judge the angels. I'm not exactly sure concerning what. But there's angels and there's evil angels that interact with us. There's evil angels that interact and, and uh, I, I believe that we're going to judge them. And we may be given the ability to judge them harshly or to be somewhat merciful in their punishment, their eternal punishment. Uh, that's what it says, what the Bible says. I, I mean, I wouldn't have said that if it wasn't written in the scripture. And that could be a really good study in itself. If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, and God has us judging things pertaining to this life now, not just saying later on you're going to judge. He said, I want you judging now. He said, judge righteous judgment now. If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. And he doesn't care about your credentials. He doesn't care that you're the pastor. He doesn't care that you're some great evangelist. He doesn't care that you're a missionary. He says, you know what? Set him that is least esteemed to judge. We'll take the new convert and we'll let him judge the matter. You know, and, and uh, Brother Knox was talking about an adulterous situation or excuse me, not an adulterous situation, but a, a situation where a man wants to divorce his wife and then the wife wants to divorce the husband. And then he says, get that new convert up there and have him judge. What does the scripture say? What does the scripture say concerning divorce? Uh, you know, and, and if they would give ear to the scripture, that judgment that they're trying to make would be overturned by what the Bible says. But they say no. We'll, we'll just take it to court. We'll, we'll go before an unrighteous judge. You know, and, and they'll act spiritual about it, but there's nothing spiritual about that. Verse 5, I speak to your shame. You ought to be ashamed. You ought to be ashamed if you choose a worldly judge, a secular judge, over the judgment of God's saints. You ought to be ashamed. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? You know, we sit before the wisdom of God Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. This book has the wisdom of God written in it. We receive that day in and day out. Do you think the judge in the average court is receiving that kind of wisdom day in and day out? No. They went to a worldly college, a worldly university and they, they received an education, but it wasn't a Bible education. And uh, I'm sure that they may even have a mistress on the side, so they don't care anything about what's right and wrong according to God and his word. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth the law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. We do so many things in front of the unbelievers in this world. We do so many things that are a bad testimony. 
some of us have even backslid and went and drank alcohol in bars with unbelievers in front of them and then we would even try to witness to them as if they're going to listen if all if it's going to fall on deaf ears because there's no power there's no testimony they want to see something different in you and if you act like any other unbeliever they're not going to listen to you and oh man it's it's just so convicting uh, you'd have to hear the message but brother Knox was talking about I, I just can't see how any judge would want to believe or get uh, be converted and, and, and trusted in Jesus Christ as their savior because of the fact that they've seen so many people that are Christians go in there and and, and do unbiblical things and, and say slanderous things against one another and and sue one another in court over property and <laughs> all kinds of different things, you know? And then you think they want to believe the gospel? You think the bailiff wants to re receive the gospel? You, you think that people that are in that court setting here in these Christians, so-called Christians, do things contrary to the Bible and act like unbelievers? You think they're actually going to receive the truth? No, they're going to say, I don't want nothing to do with that. Now therefore, there, uh, now therefore there is utterly a fault among you. And remember Jesus said, you do err not knowing the scriptures. Because you go to law with one another, why do you not rather take the wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Why do you always have to be right? Why can't you just decide I'm not going to enter into this courtroom? Why can't you just decide, you know what, you can have whatever you were after? You know what, why don't you decide, you know what, let's let's get this thing settled, husband and wife. Why don't you just take the wrong? Why don't you just admit to your wife, you know what, I haven't been a very good husband. I'm hardly even there. And you've been raising the kids by yourself. Why don't you just take the wrong, wife? Why don't you just say, you know what, I understand that you're frustrated and you want to get a divorce because... I won't even give you the due benevolence. I won't even make that sexy time with you. <laughs> make love with you. I probably just grieve the spirit right there. But you're supposed to give in sexually. And when you're not, you don't think somebody's going to go after a, another woman for it? Or, or a wife will go after another man? I mean, who are we fooling? You don't think that they would want a divorce because they have some sort of urge that you're not helping with? And, and it's strong. It's strong in all of us. And, uh, but I'm telling you, if you go and you allow yourself to be defrauded, you allow yourself to take the wrong, that's the way that humility will cause the relationships to be mended. Saying, you know what? It's okay. We're battling over this property. We're battling over this will uh, that that somebody left, a last will and testament. Um, and you you got all this, and I thought I was entitled to it. It's okay. You can have it. You can have it. I love you. I'd rather just have a, a, a strong relationship with you and not lose our friendship or our you know, or if it's a family thing. I don't. I don't want to divide myself from my brother just because I think I'm entitled to something in the will you know and so many people do this and and it's all pride centered nay you do wrong and defraud that your brethren and uh, there's more to it that we could go on but uh, I just recommend you listen to the new message from brother Knox on that matter about taking your brother to court verse 6 a fool's lips enter into contention and his mouth call for strokes a fool's li I'm still thinking about saying what I said it's not good sometimes uh, we say things that we shouldn't say you know and a multitude of words are one if not sin there's no lack of sin the more you say sometimes it's <laughs> better to, to, to think a little more before you talk But a fool's lips enter into contention. A fool is not interested in working things out and talking things out, walking things out. They just come to you with contentious words. 
They come with a heart of contention. They come with strife in their heart. They just want to argue and fight with you. A fool's mouth or a fool's lips enter into contention. You know, his lips enter into it, but his, his mind is not coming along for the ride. He doesn't use his mind. He just uses his emotions. He doesn't think before he speaks. He just rails. He just argues. Sometimes fools argue and they don't even know what they even believe or why they're arguing against another person. It's just what they do. They regularly do that. And you wonder why nobody can hardly hang around you. You wonder why when people see you, they walk the other way and act like they didn't see you. Because every time they meet up with you, you just want to argue with them. You are a fool and your lips will enter into contention and his mouth calleth for strokes and I've been around people like that where you just want to pop them you, they're calling for strokes their mouth needs to be busted you would think if I did that maybe it would teach them a lesson maybe they'd be a little more careful with their speech but they're a fool you know I, I'm just thinking of an example when I was a kid there was this there was this kid and I'm not gonna say his name and you wouldn't know anyways but he wanted to fight with me and I was gonna teach him a lesson but then even as a young kid I might have been 13 14 years old maybe 15 years old I realized this kid is an idiot this kid if I beat him good and I beat him senseless that's just what he will be senseless he will come right back because he's stupid he doesn't know any better I'm wasting my time I'm not gonna accomplish anything I'm not joking I was thinking this as a young kid he's not gonna be any better if I whoop him do you think like that or do you just Uh, you know, and you can't be that in the ministry. God says you can't be a striker or a brawler. You can't be quick to strike somebody, smite somebody. You can't be like Moses and smite that Egyptian. God says, I, you know what? You got a short fuse. I gotta, I gotta get some of that out of you if I'm gonna use you. I gotta get you alone out in that wilderness and and teach you some humility. You know, and yet Moses still in his flesh smote that rock twice when he was he was supposed to speak to the rock and it cost him entering into the promised land so and we're not justifying popping somebody in the mouth but you we all know people that when you get <laughs> you enter into a conversation if you want to call it that you just want to pop them let that not be the saints of God let that not be your testimony that you're like that a fool's mouth is his destruction, you know, and his words will condemn him. Every idle word will be used against the lost person in the day of judgment. You know, and God's going to hold them to it, everything they say, and it's going to be his destruction. God's going to determine the degrees of punishment for every little slanderous word you say, every nasty thing you said, even everything you didn't say things you wanted to say and his lips are the snare of his soul you know and 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 our uh, don't let the lips be don't let your lips be the snare of your soul how many people their soul is snared by what they said they they said something and even their pride won't allow them to change their mind or they entered into some sort of religion and uh, with their lips they professed a God that really didn't exist, that they made up in their own mind. And when somebody enters into a conversation with them, they'll argue and they'll fight tooth and nail over what they believe. And, and it's a snare to their soul. You know, maybe they believe in a certain false doctrine and they're so stubborn, they're always going to argue it. They're always going to fight with their lips. And it's a snare to you. It's a snare to your soul. Just let go of that contention. Let go of that pride. Let go of the foolish mouth. Allow God 
to change your mind. Allow God to have a foothold. Allow yourself to be defrauded in conversation. Sometimes take the raw. Sometimes admit that you don't know everything. Sometimes give in a little bit. Because it's pride. And a fool's mouth is linked to the pride in his heart. And it is a snare to his soul. Look at John chapter number 9 and verse 39. John chapter number 9 and verse 39. And we know the story about a man that was given his sight, born blind, and uh, the Pharisees weren't too happy about this when Jesus healed the blind man. And Jesus said, for judgment I am... 39 through 41, I'm just not thinking that was the right right scripture and Jesus said for judgment I am come into this world that they which see not might see and that they which see might be made blind and some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him are we blind also Jesus said unto them if ye were blind ye should have no sin but now you say we see therefore your sin remaineth They were snared. They, they had to argue everything. And they couldn't just give glory to God for this man receiving his sight. They couldn't just say, wow, you must be sent of God because of this miracle that you did. And, and they said that they could see with their mouth. And you know what? They were blind. They couldn't see. And Jesus said, but if you could say that you were blind, I could heal your blindness. If you could admit, just admit you're a sinner, just admit that you fall short of my glory. If you just admit that you're not right, God says, I can give you my righteousness. Sinner friend, if you would just admit that you're blind spiritually, you could be born again today. You could receive your sight today. You know, the old song says, I once was blind, but now I see. But you have to first realize that you're blind. If you think you see so clearly, you will not receive the help from the great physician. You will not receive sight from him. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And uh, there was a lot of arguing going on. If you wanted to read that whole chapter, chapter number 9, and, and these Pharisees, their lips were the snare to their soul. And if they could just shut up and, and give glory to God they could have something uh, with Jesus, they could have a relationship with Jesus just like this blind man received a relationship you know, it started off he said, well I don't know, I just knew that once I was blind and now I see it, well is he a righteous man? Whether he's righteous or no I don't, I don't know and before you know it he's, he's, he's calling him the son of God and he believes on his name and Jesus pulls him aside and he gives him spiritual sight, not just physical sight. And uh, it's, it's amazing, you know, it's just the progression that this man, as, he, as he, he drew closer and closer to God, and you can see it in his speech. But the fool, they don't draw closer and closer to God. Their speech causes their destruction. Their speech is just setting traps for themselves. Their speech causes them to put their foot in their mouth. And that's a fool's speech. Verse 8, The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down in the innermost parts of the belly. A talebearer. A talebearer. A person who officiously tells tales. One who impertinently communicates intelligence or anecdotes. They think they have the answer to everything. And makes mischief in society by his officiousness. So, I want to look up what is officious, officiously, kindly. You know, when, when the president kindly asks you to get vaccinated, 
we care about you kindly with solicitous care we care about you and, and, and uh, but we're gonna scold you like a child we'll start off kind but eventually it, it'll get a little more aggressive with importunate or excessive forwardness remember Jesus talked about getting your prayers answered and knocking with importunity like you just keep doing it that's what they do officiously with importunate or excessive forwardness it's excessive it's ex you don't think that's excessive the lengths they're going trying to get people vaccinated in a busy meddling manner they're meddling it's none of your business whatever happened to HIPAA those that work at nursing homes hospitals especially that's all I was getting taught when I worked in a nursing home HIPAA this HIPAA that you can't uh, reveal information and it's nobody's business now all of a sudden you have to disclose information if you're vaccinated or not what hypocrisy a person who so a tale bearer is a person who officiously tells tales and that's what they are they're tales it's not science they'll say it's science it's just wishful thinking one who impertinently communicates constant intelligence I wouldn't say it's too intelligent and makes mischief in society by his officiousness it's it's mischievous you know someone who gets into mischief is a meddler somebody who just wanders off in a, in a place where they shouldn't go and you shouldn't be trying to even knock on people's doors and get people vaccinated and they were doing that for a while I don't know if they're still doing it but like unbelievable this is unbelievable but it's the Bible so up-to-date the words of a tail bearer are his wounds and they go down to the innermost parts of the belly and it affects society it affects people that hear it it affects us turn the news off quit watching all this junk the more you give into it the more you listen to it the more you're gonna end up probably giving into it you know they'll put pressure on you they'll they'll turn the screws and eventually you're gonna cave you're gonna give in so many people have given in because of pressure because of their forwardness their excessive forwardness they won't lay off and that's a tail bearer. He also that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. Slothfulness. You know, somebody who doesn't take very good care of things, somebody who's very lazy when it comes to their job, somebody who will not give it their all when they work, they are brother to him that is great waster. You see somebody that does a half butt job <laughs> trying to be careful here but they do that half butt job you know they are the same person that they're a great waster you know what they don't care to turn the water off because they're not paying the water bill at work they'll leave it running they don't care if, if they if you were asked kindly to turn the lights off before you leave a certain place you say well don't worry about it yeah I got it and you don't care you're, you'll leave the lights on you know why because you're a great waster you you're, you don't have no problem wasting electricity you have no problem wasting people's time and uh, that's the way the slothful person is they're a great waster and I don't want to be slothful in my study I don't want to waste the time of those that hear this is the work of God this is what the Lord has called me to do and I want to do it well I want to do it with all my might and I want to benefit and not waste time you know Jesus said that we have to be redeemed in the time because the days are evil and we're in the last days and and one of the biggest problems is slothfulness and it's slothfulness in my own heart that causes me not to be diligent causes me not to be busy in the work of the Lord we're supposed to be always abounding in the work of the Lord so as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord 
but myself and, and I'm sure many others, we're being slothful. We're not being busy. We could be studying more. We could be reading the Bible more. We could be praying more for one another. We could be more involved in our church. We could be more involved in our community. But we're getting slothful and we're wasting time, precious time. You know, one thing that God can't forgive is time that is wasted. This has been Approved Unto God, and I hope you join me again next time.